And from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 16. I therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in all. But to each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it is said, when he ascended on high, he made captivity itself a captive. He gave gifts to his people. When it says he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? And he who descended is the same one who ascended far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. Until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. We must no longer be children, tossed about to and fro by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. This is the Word of God. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> A few weeks ago, I shared with you that on the way out one Sunday, someone in the church stopped and asked if I would please preach on what unifies us. And that Sunday... Uh, a few weeks ago, I tried to speak about how we are all unified by God's grace. We all stand in need of grace, and we all receive God's grace freely. After that service, somebody else came up to me and said, you know, I'm really glad you preached on what unifies us, because I started looking around at the people around me, and I thought, I got nothing in common with these people. So maybe that was your experience. I want to return to that theme today of our unity. One thing I am sure of is that our unity as a human family will never come because we are all the same. The unity that is God's gift to us is not a gift of sameness. We are not one because we all share the same lifestyle. We are not one because we have the same perspective about the world. We are not one because we have the same view of the world's problems or the same answers on how to solve them. We are not one because we all vote for the same candidate or read the same newspapers. We are not one because we all live in the same kinds of neighborhoods or hang out with the same kind of people. We are not one because we all have the same taste. We're not one because we all believe the same things. Even in a church like ours, which could stand to be a little more diverse, amen? If I passed out a piece of paper and said, please write down what you believe, and then passed it back anonymously and we read it, we would probably be shocked to discover the diversity in what we believe in this room. We confess the faith of the church but we believe a lot of different things. One of the features of our contemporary world is that we are coming to appreciate the riotous diversity of God's creation in ways that we never dreamed of before. We can see and experience other cultures and other beliefs, other traditions, other ways of living and being in the world in profound ways like never before. The unity that God gives to humanity in Christ is not the same as everyone being the same. It's a gift that is far deeper than that. 
If any letter in the New Testament makes a case for our unity, it's the letter to the Ephesians. The first three chapters of Ephesians, we picked up at chapter 4, the first three chapters of Ephesians are like a trumpet fanfare of the gracious things that God has done. God has chosen us before the foundation of the world to be God's own children. God has poured out grace on us so that our whole life is a gift. Just as I poured the water into the font, God pours grace upon us and so that our whole life is a gift. The forgiveness that allows you and me to get up each day and start fresh with another chance is grace. Every bit of it is grace. And especially important this morning is the promise of chapter 2 and in Ephesians that God has broken down the walls that divide us and has made us one with each other in Christ. From different cultures and different traditions, God has made us one in Christ. From different backgrounds and different religions, God has made us one in Christ. With different genders and different orientations, God has made us one in Christ. Different races and different ethnicities, God has made us one in Christ. Different opinions and different perspectives, God has made us one in Christ. Different values and different tastes, God has made us one in Christ. And where there was animosity, God has brought peace. And where there was a dividing wall, God has torn it down. And where there were strangers, now there are friends. And where we were enemies, now we are brothers and sisters to each other. Now the grace of God that is declared to us in Ephesians is a cosmic grace. I do not believe it is a grace just for the church, but it is a grace for all humanity. Because Paul is talking about Jews and everyone who's not a Jew and how God has brought them together in Christ. One common human family, one household, one body, a grace of unity that flows not from our sameness, but from the unity of God, not from our agreement, but from God who is one and who makes us one. Last November, Gabriel Kahane was to surprise to discover a gift of unity that he didn't expect. Kahane is a singer and songwriter who lives in Brooklyn. And he wrote about his experience in the New York Times of taking a, a train trip across the country overnight. It was in 2016, he wanted to write songs about travel. And he wanted to get out of the bubble of New York. And so he decided to ride the trains across the country. And he would leave the day after the election, no matter who won. So he took a small suitcase and left his phone behind, forget this, 13 days. Can you imagine going without your cell phone for 13 days? His trip covered 8,930 miles, six trains, and 31 states. The only news that he heard on the way was what he picked up from other passengers. Now, for the most of us who have never been on an overnight train trip, he describes how the process works. The, the attendant comes by in the morning and asks for your meal reservation. And you tell the attendant if you're planning to be at breakfast or lunch. And then when it comes time for breakfast or lunch, you, you line up with others. And if you're traveling alone, like Gabriel Kahane was, they put you together with other travelers so they can make up a table of four. So in this 13-day trip, he ate with 80 passengers who were strangers to him, surviving mostly on three cheese tortellini with creamy sauce and vegetable medley. He shared a table with a nuclear engineer, truck drivers, retirees heading to and from the Grand Canyon, a music publicist, a TV personality, a cowboy, a flight attendant, an actuary, an air conditioner salesman. Makes you want to take a train ride, doesn't it? And he writes about those experiences where much of the digital world finds us sorting ourselves neatly into cultural and ideological silos, the train, in my experience, does exactly the opposite. 
It also acts by some numinous, unseen force as a kind of industrial strength social lubricant. And to be sure, I encountered people whose politics I found abhorrent, dangerous, and destructive. But in just about every instance, there was something about the person's relationship to family and loyalty to family that I found deeply moving. That ability to connect across an ideological divide seemed predicated on the fact that we were quite literally breaking bread together. What Cahain found on an Amtrak dining car is what God intends us to find in the church. The church is meant to be God's Amtrak dining car where we come and are placed at table with others and discover in breaking the bread of life that there is a common grace and a common humanity that unites us underneath all of our varied and riotous differences. As a downtown church, we get to uh, live this out in a special way. We're not located in a suburb or along a highway. If we were, we would have a lot more parking and the building would be a lot easier to get around. But we would almost certainly be more alike, more the same. Instead, we are located downtown. We are in an equal opportunity, inconvenient location for people from all walks of life. Here in the center of our city, God brings us together as a diverse body of Christ. North, south, east, west, conservative, liberal, rich, poor, cool, not cool, traditional, contemporary, hamburgers, filet mignon, barbecue, seafood, whatever. You name it. The riotous diversity of God's creation may find a place in worship here. Part of our vision as a congregation is to be in deep relationships with one another across our differences. To know one another and care for one another. To provide for one another and pray for one another. To celebrate with one another and cry with one another in a way that gives witness to the deep unity of the body of Christ. And we must never lose sight of that unity a unity that is deep enough to embrace our diversity. Now, a year on from Charlottesville, we must never lose sight of that unity. A unity that is deep enough to embrace our diversity, for we are one in Christ. And we must always resist the temptation or the natural inclination to gather up with our kind of people and be the same. The truth is the church doesn't often live up to this calling very well. The history of the Protestant church is a history of dividing ourselves according to what we believe. Putting aside the unity of the church for what we perceive to be the purity of the church. The General Assembly of the PCUSA, our denomination, met this summer at its uh, every two year meeting. It was by all accounts a far less contentious meeting than meetings have been in many years. But I believe the lack of contention was largely because our denomination is increasingly ideologically homogenous. And like the polarizing forces that are at work in our society, the same forces are at work in the church, driving us into separate silos. And I fear that we are living into a unity of sameness and not the unity of grace. In a world with many labels and many divisions, God's vision for the church is more like the Amtrak dining car where we gather around the bread of life and see one another for who we are and love one another in all our beauty and in all our brokenness. Richard Ward, a teacher and preacher, writes that Christ's body is that place at the intersection of divine and human life where sovereignty, brokenness, and communion are held together in grace. Let me say that again. Christ's body is that place at the intersection of divine and human life where sovereignty, brokenness, and communion are held together in grace. Our calling is to receive this gift 
and live into this gift with every effort that we have. Paul says in Ephesians that we are to make every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in in the bond of peace. And the Greek word that he uses there is an athletic word. Now, I'm not an athlete, but I'm going to have to imagine what this is. It's an athletic word that means to strain every muscle in your body. To reach so hard that every muscle and ligament is straining. He says, make that kind of effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So he says, be gentle. You will not live into your unity by being rough with one another or by allowing your heart to never be moved or even never be broken by one another. Strive with all you have to be gentle. Be humble, Paul says. You will not live into your unity by insisting that you are right or that you are better. Strive with all you have to be humble. Bear with one another in love. Because the truth is, all of us need some bearing with every now and then. Love is the real work of being in community with people who are in your everyday life, who cross your path, maybe on the way to breakfast or on the way to work. All of us are under construction in some part of our lives. Love means bearing with the parts of others that are still under construction, even as they bear with the parts of us that are still under construction. Gentleness, humility, love that bears with, that is how we keep this gift of unity that God gives us. The most recent journal of the Yale Divinity School uh, Journal Reflections A variety of scholars and clergy and other individuals looked at how we do this hard work of unity in a climate of division and divisiveness. In that journal, Chris Coons, who's a senator from Delaware, writes about trying to maintain unity beyond the divisions of the U.S. Senate. Good luck, right? He writes, as Americans, we're viewing each other more and more through overly simplified, inadequate, and divisive indicators. As urban or rural, white-collar or blue-collar, religious or agnostic, the list goes on. Because of that, we're missing the more difficult, more complicated, and more accurate pictures of people who aren't just our political allies or enemies, but our fellow citizens. So in the Senate, they've come up with a way to try to combat this. Once a week, a bipartisan group of two dozen senators get together, pray together, sing together, and most importantly, listen to each other at something called the Senate Prayer Breakfast. And Senator Coon's home in Delaware is close enough that he can travel home each night to sleep in his own bed. But on Tuesday nights, he stays in D.C. so that he can be at the 8 a.m. prayer breakfast. Again, he writes, What we do every Wednesday morning is seek out the real people behind those simplistic labels. The man or woman with whom we'll have to have difficult conversations on the Senate floor or the committee room later that day. That can be hard for anyone. It's only possible through a willingness to be truly honest and even vulnerable not only to friends but also to rivals and enemies. That's what makes the Senate prayer breakfast different from a congressional delegation trip or running into a colleague in the Senate gym. The attitude of humility and trust with which we open our hearts to the work of the Spirit. That is living into the calling with which we have been called in Christ Jesus. God has made us one family in the crucified, risen, and cosmic Christ. We are one. And God's dream for the church is to be the meeting table where we eat the bread of life with an attitude of humility and trust, opening our hearts to the work of God's Spirit. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.